to Corner to Corner podcast and this is a very special and quite exciting episode mm. of the show tonight but first I'm going to introduce my co-host Mr Paul. Yes hello Mr Jeff <laughs> that's me I am here how are you tonight? Uh, I'm fine thanks we can hear good, a good, voice good. from somewhere in the we distance. Can, yeah there, it's like there's we? an announcer yeah, a universal th- announcer or something. I thought it was the one in your head you know the other one coming out but maybe not. So <laughs> that's usually only on a Saturday. <laughs> yeah. oh, sorry that's that's me I'm upstairs in a pub Oh, of course pub. you are, Dick. <laughs> now, why would you not be in a pub? pub? Quiz. There's a pub quiz going below. <laughs> oh, that is we'll, so unsurprising. <laughs> we'll keep a, a listen out for the questions. Maybe we can, uh, you know, chip in some answers. Mm. Um, well, we're joined. I'll, I'll, mute. Some... I'll mute as much as I can. <laughs> no, no, don't do that. We we need to. It's it's good. It's ambiance. Yeah, it's it's environment. It's so we'll take that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, as you may have guessed by now, we've got a couple of guests with us tonight. Mm. So we're very pleased to welcome uh, from the BFI, uh, BFI's lead programmer, Justin Johnson, uh, and the Archive TV programmer, Dick Fiddy. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. How are you both? Hello. I, yeah, we're I, great. I, we are echoing around the, uh, the it, it, it's, it's whichever, that pub quiz, which, isn't it? Which pub are you in, Dick? <laughs> I'm in the Devro, at the, um, near the, the Royal Courts of Justice. Well, it's got shocking acoustics. You can tell them that from us. <laughs> well, they've, they've very kindly allowed me into the function room upstairs. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. We, oh, we didn't hear <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the only person in here. Oh, look at that! Are, you are. <laughs> <laughs> really are. I'm still like been alone in a pub's function room. All on your own, Sim. <laughs> we haven't interrupted your pub quizzing tonight, have we? You have, but that's oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. I feel almost sorry for him. <laughs> 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 yeah. Do you do a fair bit of then? You you part of a part of a team, Dick? Do you do, do yeah. like a, yeah? Yeah, a serious team. Yeah. Uh, Is there any Doctor Who questions in there? Or anything like that? Very few. It's very much a highbrow quiz. Oh, is it? That uh, <laughs> yeah. they they. they um, they expressly asked me to join the team because they get a lot of old man questions, as they call them. <laughs> oh, I just, can, we, can, can we just explore for a moment the idea that Doctor Who is not highbrow somehow? I know. I, I'm still reeling from that I'm one. I'm glad you yeah. asked that, Justin. Mm. Yeah, I, was, I, was... Now, I think what they mean is television and cinema isn't highbrow. Oh, good say. Obviously, I don't agree with that. No, no. Quite right. Quite right. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, let's kick things off tonight by uh, I'm going to ask the pair of you to tell us a little bit about your respective job roles at the BFI and, and what you do so you can fight it out amongst yourself who goes first. <laughs> Dick, over to you. Well, I've been the I've been programming television, archive television at the BFI for about 30 years now. Um, it was something that when we had the Museum of the Moving Image um, yes, in the, on the premises, mm. they decided that they were going to um, uh, make sure that television was represented as well as film uh, at the South Bank. And to that end, we did an arrangement with the craft unions uh, to allow us to show a certain amount of television per year, per year from the archive. And um, obviously they, they wanted someone that had a, a history of working with the archives and understood um, old TV, as it were. Mm. It's not an easy thing because, especially for young generations, old television is a very strange beast. You know, <laughs> if it was shot on videotape or in the studio, and not yeah. on film, it's it's creepy, and you need um you, you need to sort of in, lull them in gently, the, our, our audiences to the past. So that was that's what we've been doing for these years. Okay, interesting. And, mm, we'll come and, back to um, that. And my job is I, I'm I'm the uh, lead programmer for the South Bank, so I look after the film and TV program, and and work with a team of people deciding what seasons and events we're going to put on uh, throughout the year. Uh, and I think it's fair enough to say, I mean, but even you know, like sort of going back before my time when Dick was uh, was was working before I started, actually Doctor Who has always played a part in that story, hasn't mm. it? There's a Doctor Who exhibition yeah. at the museum, and um, there's a history of kind of. Through the Missing Believe Wiped initiative the BFI has, which, which Dick spearheads, um, we've had sort of missing episodes as and when they've appeared as yes. well. Yes. Mm. Um, so there's always been a rich sort of um, history of the BFI and Doctor Who. Yeah, even before my, t- my time, they did the uh, Manuel Alvarado's The Unfolding Text was the first sort of event they did. And they looked at, I think, the the 10th anniversary of Doctor Who. So they have mm. been, yeah, we've been... In- Doctor Who's been embedded within the BFI ethos for a while now. 
Yeah, quite. And also, I think there was um there was a the, the, the VHSs they did like the other like there was the Tom Baker years and stuff. I'm sure he did that from Momi, didn't he? Oh, yeah, I think he did. There was, yeah. there was events that were there because we had a, a Doctor Who exhibition mm. behind the sofa type of exhibition. There, yeah. Um, but but anyway, but in terms of um. Uh, the more recent story of Doctor Who and the BFI. Back in 2013, for the 50th anniversary, uh, Dick and I co-organised a year of Doctor Who, which we did in partnership with the BBC. And every month, starting in January, with William Hartnell going mm. through the year, um, we did a sort of series of of, um, of of Doctor Who events, which kind of culminated in November with um, obviously the you know the the big Matt Smith 50th anniversary yeah. story, mm. which we played in an FT1 with John Hurt and all the sort of various Doctor Who luminaries there. And um, because it moved from, uh, it was going to be at the XL, I think. Um, or the, there was a big celebration the XL, which Nick yeah. and I were both involved with. Um, but the actual screening element, because it ended up being at the BFI, mm. they kind of moved their sort of after show party, sort of BBC Three event, which also then ended up being on site, which we didn't organise. Hey, it was a kind of private hire. All but right. it's gone down as being one of the most peculiar. Yes, and, uh, <laughs> it was a bit weird. Yeah. Extraordinary bits of TV, and Dick, <laughs> Dick and I were both there watching it happen live, and it was. Uh, yeah. An astonishing thing to be, <laughs> to be there for, but so we did that anyway, basically, and then we sort of stopped for a few years, and mm. we were asked if we wanted to do something in 2015 for the anniversary of the new show, and we kind of turned that down because we felt if we couldn't do anything as good as we were doing during that anniversary, yeah, yeah. Yeah. we wanted to do it again. And then um, when the BBC started sort of doing the animations and the box sets, there seemed to be a kind of quite a good reason to sort of to restart doing them again, and 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 so. Um, in recent years, we've kind of um, premiered the the new animation um, sort of uh, episodes, mm. and we've also then, as each of these box sets have been coming out, we've kind of chosen one of the stories, usually something that's been remastered, or it's got something special about it, with you know any guests that we can get from mm. both the people who remastered or did the sound, plus people from the actual show itself. And there are certain eras of Doctor Who that are more difficult than others. You know, you can mm. actually find quite a few people from. You know, maybe the Patrick Troughton era, but actually yeah. a lot from Tom Baker era, for example. And you know, it's, it's it's quite interesting how that's worked out. But basically, the bottom line is, is we have now um, been running these events after a while. They're great, great fun to do. They're very, very labour intensive. Mm. We both got our kind of day jobs to do, and 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 uh, but uh, probably a, 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 a bizarre amount, well, an unproportionately large amount of time into these events that we probably should do, bearing in mind all the other stuff we have to do. But <laughs> they, are, they are they are something we really enjoy doing. That's I great. think one of the things is we don't have to rehearse much mm. because we actually know each other well enough that we can um, we can introduce them without having to do a lot of uh, preliminary work between ourselves. Uh, the the actual um, administration comes in getting the guests there and making sure the dates are right, getting cars for people etc etc yeah yeah they 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 are massively popular events mm. i know whenever whenever we're ramping up to one like we are now um you can just see the buzz online just mm. just kind of explodes and and it seems to have been a i mean from your perspective has that been a gradual thing or has it always been quite um quite quite full on i think it was surprising to us when we did the uh, the anniversary mm. um just how quickly it took off almost from the very first event we did it, it, it although it yeah, it did build a little but it was even the first one the william hartnell yeah. era was incredibly popular yeah 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 it's it's like paul said whenever so as we're recording now i don't think or maybe some people online know it's all going on sale tomorrow for, for the new one which we'll talk about in a bit but i've seen people absolutely desperate to to go and see you know a favorite episode being screened with, with cast there and people you know I'll, I'll pay whatever who's got a ticket let, let <laughs> yeah. me have a ticket you know i've got two kids i only need one of them you know it's, it's this sort of thing you know and it's it's quite you know it's it's like trying to get concert tickets in a way and i think it's it's so exciting it's, it's great I mean, it's tricky because obviously we're, yeah we only mm. have 450 seats in nft1 which is our biggest cinema um part of the reason i think the events work so well is because obviously you know they they there is an intimacy to doing mm. that it's not yeah i guess yeah although i guess there was a sort of a convention environment that we haven't to be honest it wasn't initially by design mm. but because a lot of people now just turn up and they go to the bar regardless of whether they got a ticket or not we've now got the um the uh you know the the, the quiz that happens i'm run mm. by monkey and we often do signings and stuff to um, sort of, yeah, we, we produce like a postcard and we, we, you know, people can sell their autographs and that if they want to afterwards. Um, and because we, we always try and have 
you know various bits so if, if we were say doing a four-part story or a six-part story we would probably show a couple of episodes and have a little yeah. panel and do a couple more episodes and do another little panel um and it might be you know mark Ayers might come and talk about the sound or we might have someone like louise coming and talking about playing lila or whoever it might be we try and sort of break things up and, and give it a sort of it's not just straight viewing experience although the viewing experience is fun because how often do you with tv get a chance to watch mm. your favorite tv show with a room full of 400 people yeah. so i guess the, screen, the, um, yeah. the downside to that is obviously the demand is much much bigger mm. we do get people who are upset both that they don't get tickets or B that it's happening in London and that they might be in a different part of the country. And people do come, we, we usually try and do them at 12 o'clock is because it works quite well for people to get back down and then yeah. come back in the evening. But the problem is, you know, the BFI only has one <laughs> cinema and that's in, in London. Um, other cinemas, I guess, could try and do their own and have it, I think, in the past done their own if, if the cinema is enthusiastic enough and, mm. and they can make that kind of contact. So it's nothing to stop other people doing it, but... Obviously, yeah. we have sort of made it our little sort of, um, you know, it's become quite an important project for us. Mm. Yeah. We, we had a, a question from, uh, we, we've got a couple of questions from Twitter uh, followers tonight, but um, James Courtney asked, would you be open to, to running events around the country? And, and I think you've kind of answered it there. You know, we, we were talking about it earlier, Paul, you know, the, the BFI's, but, you know, base is there in London, isn't it? And I didn't think you had other branches around the country particularly. So, <laughs> branches, you know, yeah doing uh, you know additional screenings is obviously difficult in, in that in that way really isn't it so hopefully that answers that question for people. and we don't have budgets either i mean we're being really really you know so yeah we um the bfi is a charity mm. um yeah the, the, the everything that that um is done for the bfi and the sort of more commercial side goes and back into the bfi we don't have unlimited budgets to pay people mm. and yeah and bring people in and we're lucky that i guess being in london we have got i guess a better opportunity of getting people and the other thing without wanting to sort of it, i guess because it is the bfi people feel i guess more inclined to come and be on that stage where you know the greats of cinema and tv have sat before them if i'm mm. Mr. Yeah, Bouter. there's a there's a kudos to it, isn't there? And you know, there's 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 a respect to the name for for BFI, and yeah, I think it's an enticement for people to to get involved. Um, yeah, I think there's um, other circumstances. Obviously, mm. as we've said, if regional theatres want to do those sort of events, I mean, we we're happy to help and with advice, but they but basically they have to get the okay from from the yeah. BBC, you know, they, it, it's their brand mm -hmm. and, and they're careful about how they use it. And also they can't, they, they also haven't got the budget to, mm. to work with these things all over the country. You know, it would have to be, have to be specialized. And as Justin says, very often, not only have we got access to guests because the, the location, but also you do get that feeling that some guests want to do the BFI because there's an element of prestige there. Mm -hmm. And also, I, I, oh, sorry, Paul. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I, I think you're right there as well. It's interesting here about the, or, you know, using the word convention because I think a lot of conventions back in the early days did kind of start out almost as like semi-private screenings, weren't they? You know, a bunch of fans getting together with a with a projector screen and a and a, a, a reel of old film and literally just sitting around and just blasting these things at the at the screen. It's interesting to see how far it's kind of come and yet still has that legacy very much in hand but i think there's there's two distinctive types of uh, convention there's mm. the fan run conventions that have been going a lot longer and there are some of those still around and they have um, a much friendlier a much mm. uh, much cheaper yeah yeah um, ethos. and then there's the professional convention yeah. the big um, that are there designed, yeah. designed to make money and designed mm. to to get the best guests and and to run in the most prestigious places, and we fit somewhere in between the two, mm. because we're obviously we're, we're cheaper than than going to a convention, yet we can give you a bit of the convention experience. Mm. So over a year at the BFI, we've probably got sort of I don't know eight ten events, which if they were all in one weekend, that would be a proper convention. Yeah, that would be yeah. a huge convention because they're spread out. People are, you know, it doesn't cost people as much, yeah. and and they can come along and see some of those, mm. some of the, the people from the screen and from behind the scenes up close, and they like that, and they get a chance to ask them questions because yeah. we always throw questions over the audience, you know. And I think there's that thing as well that um, 
There's just something about, as Justin was saying, another 150, mm. 200 people just turn up to be in the bar afterwards to yeah. meet the other people. And that's when you get that real convention feel. Mm. And I think that is something that has developed over the years. I don't think that was happening um, 10 years ago. That's something that's that's been relatively recent. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, if, if they, there were, um, you know, other events nationwide, it would start to lose its, you know, uh, you know, the energy of it all a little bit. Do you know what I mean? If, or it would change, wouldn't it? It would become yeah, something different, I think. It would become a bit different. It's quite special having it there at the beer fire. Well, so one of the nice things, I think, is that um, there was a perception, I think, that the same people mm. go every time. And every every event that we do, people will come up to us and say, I've never been to one of these before. I've it's always my first one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's my first one and stuff. So that does show that, you know, people are getting in that, that haven't been before. And, um, you know, it, we, we try and be really fair as we can. We try and hold on to as little number of tickets as we can to make sure everybody gets a chance to be in there. So how closely do you work with the BBC for the events? Or, you know, is it left up entirely up to you guys what, happens who's there what's screened and all, all of that so we, we we actually work uh in partnership with mm. BBC studios on these events um when we were doing the anniversary year we used to work with um you know with, with the actual kind of you know the uh the like the brand manager and the other mm. guys who worked on the show direct would uh be uh edward russell that would have been edward russell yeah. in the day Look out for um, his podcast soon Just indeed yeah <laughs> <laughs> we spoke to him a few a few days oh, yeah. ago yeah, oh, okay, yeah. yeah. So we used to work with Edward on those. Yeah. Um, and then now we work more with the guys who are who are um commissioning the content, like Russell Minton and so forth, mm. um, who are commissioning the content and who are kind of marketing the content. And they are the people who really I mean they're very kind they don't they don't have, have to allow us to do these. They're very kind of allowed to put these events on. And uh, we work with them as to what story it will be. I mean, like Russell will say, well, you know, we, we, we've got a 5.1 mix of this one mm. and remaster stuff. So what about this? And we'll have a bit of discussion. It might be that a story that we did in 2013 um, comes up. So be, well, we don't want to repeat ourselves. We want to do something we didn't do in, in that year. Um, sometimes it might be around which guests might be available. Yeah. Uh, because obviously we really wanted um, Louise Jameson to be at this one. Louise is, you know, uh, always such a fantastic guest to have. Um, and you know, it depends which episodes in that position he might have been in, or I mean, it might have been somebody else who's no longer with us. So there's lots of different considerations that we kind of yeah. take into account. It seems to be that the um, the release of the Doctor Who collection <laughs> Blu-ray box sets have, have given you quite a good framework to hang the events on. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't think we would. We wouldn't just do them willy nilly. I mean, we need we kind of need the reason to do them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you're right that that, that does give us a really yeah because there's new content. Part part of what we do is we're showing a, a usually a restored story that you know that's going to be just in better condition than it probably ever was when they watched on TV back in the day, um, with the people who helped make the show, and we also as part of the presentation will show bits of some of the you know some of the value added material that's been created mm. in the box set. Which they can get to see early before before the box set comes out. So, um, no, so 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 yeah, it's it's um it's it's something we, we don't even we do it for the particular reason to do it. We, yeah. you know, we just sort of, I mean, I, you know, being really um, blatant about, it, I guess you know, if you wanted to sort of just, you know sell tickets every day and get people to do Doctor Who, but that is not that's not why we do it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Then, then it's uh, it's not just a, well, uh, something else. Doctor to be a fine. Doctor Who brings something else to the mix as well. It's very age, it's very longevity mm. means that and the story of Doctor Who is virtually the story of the last 50 years of 60 yeah, years of British yeah. television. Mm. So, you know, it started off in black and white, it mm. was studio bound, it changed it the colour. You know, it, it's gone through the gamut. And when it returned and um, and became the sort of modern show it was, it also tells you the story of what happened to modern television, up, up to and including, you know, being partnered with Disney. You know, mm. Mm. You know that's that's really interesting, actually. I, I hadn't really Very thought much about so, yeah. that stupidly, but you're, you're exactly right, Dick. You, you know, the show itself is a great kind of chronicle of television development, isn't it? Uh, yeah, uh, and it's... it's and... and looking at it through the window of one adventure, mm. one, you know, one unfolding text, yeah. Is is a really good way to 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 in a in an entertaining way 
to tell a historical story. Yeah, mm. yeah. Because I suppose Doctor Who, in in many ways, has both driven innovations within TV broadcasting technology, recording technology, and sound, and everything else, and has also been steered itself, influenced by other in- innovations by other people. It seems to be like a collecting point. Point, you know, when you think of. Barry Letts' early experiments with CSO in the in the early seventies, and you know the the sort of yellow screen efforts that that they did, and then when you look at nineteen seventy seven seventy eight series, how much they tried to do what Star Wars was doing on a shoestring budget, you know what but I mean? You, it's, you, you hit the nail on the head. Then it's only recently that they've been mm. given a substantial budget. I mean, you're right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they have been innovative in the past, but a lot yeah. of that was to do with the fact they didn't have any money. Well, that's so it, though, isn't it? Yeah. That, that's that's, that's a big yeah. driver of innovation. We, you know, we yeah. need to look like Star Wars, but we've only got two and six to do it on. So <laughs> what do we do, guys? Get on with it, you know what yeah. I mean? And he start cutting up egg boxes and trying to make string look invisible and, and come up with CSO and various and actually, I, had, I have to say, one of the things, you know, mm. when you play TV, archive TV on a big screen like we do at the BFI, yeah. Sometimes, you know, it can show up, all the sort of deluxe yeah, and, and, and join. But actually, despite the fact that people laugh about Doctor Who and the, the wonky sets and stuff, actually, I'm surprised at how that isn't actually a, the case a lot mm. of the time. And actually, you know, there might be one or two episodes here and there that people always refer to. But actually, when you bear in mind what they were doing with an incredibly talented group of people mm. uh, with a very low budget Absolutely. in the scheme of things, and actually, quite often, I think, you know, it's kind of what you are just saying then, really, which is that when you have a low budget, actually, you're a lot more creative in what you then do with that budget than yeah. if you're just given unlimited millions. Yeah. And yeah, I think that, um, there's some incredible creativity on display in those yeah. early shows. And, and we've talked about this before, but I think you, you can't look at episodes from, you know, 40 years ago um, and fairly kind of, you know, criticise or take the mick out of the effects and stuff, because it at the time you know within reason it was kind of cutting edge stuff you know and and so do you know what i mean you, you, you know you have to look at it and accept it for what it is and, and enjoy the story rather than going oh you know it's a little mm. rubbish now but at the time it, it didn't you know by and large but also i quite like the um you know the fact that you you can tell that you know it's people working you know pushing their creativity with yeah. huge pots of money behind them and you know that I think that's quite it's quite nice. It kind of feels hand you know homemade in a way. It feels very BBC. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Very <laughs> yeah. very yeah. BBC. Yeah. Talking of which, then so um, so you guys on the Sunday on Sunday fourth of February. So we've got the horror of Fang Rock coming up, haven't we? Now when you talk about a studio bound story up on the big screen, that's essentially what that is. So all filmed at Pebble Mill on a on a very very small scale set, wasn't it? So looking forward to that one. Yeah, I think one of the things that does become evident when you watch this stuff is that mm. really, even though technically it can be tricky, it's you the writing was usually pretty good. It could be, oh, yes. it could be rescued by decent yeah. writing. I mean there have been there have been pits and troughs. There have been a couple of times when the writing's let them down. But overall I think the ideas that are prevalent there, the storylines, mm. the, the, the the writers are pretty good. And I think that shows now with the big finish stuff, because I think one of the things is, you know, even though because it's audio, the, mm. the you know, the special effects sound fantastic, mm. it's still carried by the writing. And I, th- I think the writing on the big finish stuff is as good as, as any Doctor Who mm. writing. Yeah. I think and, and, um, Horror Fang Rock is is an absolute masterclass in writing. I think it's Terence Dix at its best, and 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 you're absolutely right, Dick. I think when when the story is that good and the writing is that good, it transcends everything else. But I think with Har- Horror Fang Rock, everything contributes to it. The isolated setting, the moody lighting, the sense of creeping terror that goes throughout it, and I think you know with those sort of things very quickly, you kind of forget about anything that might be. Creaky, and I don't think there is anything really creaky in in horror fan rock. It might be, I think there's a little special effect of the the spaceship kind of landing in the ocean, and maybe the alien itself. But it doesn't matter. It's all part of the exactly menace was, of the whole thing, isn't yeah, it? You, you might look at it and go, oh, "It's a bit rubbish," but the story is so good that I think you can look past it and and sure. fully, you know, absorbed into it. 
Mm. I see it's very gothic. It's got a very hammer. Yes. Feel to it. It's like the materialized onto a hammer lot. You know? Yes, yeah, yeah. it is very much so. Yeah. Do you know what? My, my daughter, she's 16 years old. And whenever I force her, you know, sort of tie her to the chair and force her to watch old Doctor Who, she said it creeps her out a lot more than really? the than the new stuff does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's just like, and I think it's something about that almost brightly lit videotaped mm, mm. kind of studio claustrophobia that, that a lot of these stories. <laughs> exude through the tv screen that you know when you look at something like sapphire and steel which is which is a lot of that you know but with the lights turned down mostly that used to terrify me as a kid but yeah you know, actually, it's i think it still pervades even now and and you mentioned big finish there as well dick i think quite a lot of their particularly fourth doctor audios kind of fit that hammer horror type feel they really push that kind of gothic stuff mm. on a lot of those and you know the soundscapes work brilliantly to kind of you know mm. capture what horror fan fang rock does visually on screen i, I i'm quite a big fan of spooky who stuff he does like his uh, spooky yeah I, I do yeah mm. <laughs> i guess it's it, it kind of it, it's that kind of um just just post hintcliffe period isn't it so it still yeah. feels mm. in that that's definitely a story you feel could have been produced by philip hinchcliffe very much so yeah. um and uh, and then it kind of changes, doesn't it, with Graham Williams quite a lot. Yeah, it it, it does, but I, I still like it. Do you know what? Talking about that, actually, I was, I was I was I was on Twitter. I refuse to call it X. It's not that I refuse. I just I can't get in my head that it's called no, X. It's I, still I can't Twitter. call it X. <laughs> no, but um, was it Cutaway Comics? They did a little tweet for their Philip Hinchcliffe, um, you know, book and package and what have you. And they said, "What's your favorite Philip Hinchcliffe?" And I I, I came out with something, but then I said, "Also, horror of fan rock deserves a, an honourable mention." And I knew it was a Graham Williams story, but in my head, it was definitely, as you say, of the that of that kind of season 14 vibe because it just yeah it's a yeah. transition isn't it i think by the end of that season it does start to feel very different to how it started but i also think that there is a, there is something to do about the passing of time because mm. you were saying that you're showing your 16 year old uh, yeah. old doctor who there is something about it was made so so long ago mm. to her yeah don't make me feel that old curious about that there's a there's a new <laughs> about that i feel the same about the 1930s uh, universal stuff. horrors because oh, they, yeah, yeah. Are further, they are so far back from mm. my experience that there's some strangeness about them that's mm. been bought on by the veneer of time i think you're right mm. and, and uh, well, just talking of those for example you know in like the 60 years of who the fact that the hammer stuff is you know approaching 100 mm. years old is you know like like you know disney stuff recently you know mickey and things at, at, blows my mind that stuff is almost a century <laughs> old you know and still entertaining us today you know i think that's incredible it's fascinating to be honest the other thing i do think is interesting about obviously the events that we do at the bfi we mm. talked about having a kind of a kind of semi-convention sort of quality to them but um i'm amazed that there is still anything new to say about the show um <laughs> in terms of people who who have an association you know they might have they might have an association which involves being mm. in three episodes in the 1970s yeah. but you can still you know they still can come along and, and say something really interesting about the show that maybe hasn't yeah. been before. I know there's lots of stories, but and, and the other thing I think about the mm. VFX is because the audience is not necessarily just a kind of an audience that is made up of the sort of the Uber fans and convention goers. It's also some of the BFI members who perhaps have a real love of the show, but haven't necessarily dabbled into sort of fandom in a, in a, mm. in a kind of way and beyond that. Heard that stuff. Um, so and, yeah. And also the show is, you know, that the stuff that is being, um, you know, put in the collection sets now and that you're doing screenings for in another 20 years, we'll be looking back at Eccleston and Tennant stuff in the mm. same way. And there'll be a ton more stories and, you know, it'll just keep on going mm. like that, won't it? You know? It, yeah, I mean, I mean that's, that's the way it's looking at the moment. It, the show's um, definitely so, showing no signs of tiring and it is kind of evolving and, and moving on, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. So... How far in advance are you working on screenings? I suppose that's a semi unsubtle way of saying what's next. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so obviously we we um, have a kind of a little bubble of confidentiality with BBC yeah. Studios, who of course do yeah. kind of share stuff with us. Obviously, the thing from our point of view is that our mm. cinema spaces uh, get booked up very quickly, so we always try and book things in, um, pencil them in. So um, with the um, with the horror fang rock, we did know we were doing it a while ago, mm. but we, but it, um, because the, we knew the announcement wasn't going to be made until um, this week, 
uh what so it was last was it no sorry last week um we couldn't get mm. in normal brochure so in our, in our ordinary kind of february brochure there's a little sort oh, of there's yeah. a sort of gap where it is saying oh you know screening to be announced which right. could be anything, you know so that was why we kind of have to announce this one so near because we had to tie it with their announcement but normally they're announced in good time for us to do that but um but you know i mean it certainly looks as if there are going to be other things happening at bbc studios and the bfi in the future um yeah, yeah. one thing I, I guess at some point um is it wouldn't be particularly surprising if at some point when it's announced that um uh the celestial toy maker will I was just going to say have, yeah yeah have a screening at the bfi um yeah. that wouldn't be a, a huge surprise to anybody i don't imagine mm. uh, but beyond that who knows as they say uh, you know what's this space okay. <laughs> and also i suppose on the the guests that you could get for that you know it's um peter purves yeah. peter purves would seem to be a kind of a, a given i guess in some ways but... really it's really it's really tricky because sometimes um you know sometimes we you know we, we, we mm. can't always get people um you know in they they've got busy lives and we've only yeah, got of course. Time to do it so some some of our screenings we do end up getting the jackpot and we get everybody in mm. and um you know like when we did the um the five doctors you know we were lucky enough to you know we had yeah. Sarah Sutton, we had um uh, janet fielding we had peter davison you know we had, so, so it was kind of you luck out when something like that happens mm. other times you know it might just be we just can't get anybody um but but you know you get the opportunity still to watch it on the big screen and <clears throat> we'll like for example if it's with the animation we might get some mm. of the animators there peter purvis has done a couple with us um mm. I know he's very busy at the moment. He's filming uh, bits and pieces at the moment and doing other stuff. And obviously the other thing is, obviously there are big conventions all over the world, aren't there? Who, I know, yeah. Um, yeah. Who, who these these people are in so, demand now, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, so yeah I'm, I'm going no off to Los Angeles now. Yeah, no, I, sorry, I can't come to London, South Bank. I would love to. I would really love to. But yeah, I'm going to be on a, on a beach in Malibu, on Malibu Beach. That's where I'm going to well, be. You're right, Chicago Tardis, Gallifrey One, they yeah. just... They just tend to suck up those big guests, you know, um, because they're huge conventions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we, we've spoken to a few people who've been to <gasps> G- Galley One and it sounds, you know, fantastic mm. out there. So maybe one day Paul will uh, will hit, hit yeah, the LA yeah. scene. Can I, can I just ask, sorry, Jeff, before, before you go on. So I mean, just talking about that difference in conventions then. So what? how would you describe the vibe um, within the BFI screenings for, for Doctor Who? If you were... If, if you were if you were trying to sell it to somebody who who's, yeah, who's well, a bit nervous, perhaps of, of coming along, maybe a little bit kind of, oh, I've never really done that sort of thing before. Eh? How would you describe it to them to make them feel at ease? Yeah, what's it like being at one? I'd say very <laughs> celebratory. Very well, sorry. Celebratory. It's celebratory. Oh, okay. Mm. There are people I know. So I, I, I've seen just by having read little bits on Twitter here and there, but there are some people who feel very anxious about going to. Mm. Uh, environments like that, not just because um, of the whole thing about, you know, because some, some people might do a bit of cosplay or some people might, um, you know, be a bit more kind of outgoing in that respect, but also because they might have a very personal relationship with the show. Mm. They watch it by themselves in their, wherever they live. They don't you know, necessarily know anybody else who knows the show, but they kind of like the idea of coming to see it. And actually, you know, genuinely, I think do feel a bit nervous coming about coming out. But I think the nice thing is, um, is that it feels very inclusive Mm. And I think people who come along, um, you know, a lot of people put on Twitter, I'm going to my first one, I'm a bit nervous, and people will reach out to them and say, well, yeah. don't worry, I'll be there, look out for me, yeah. I'm doing this badge, or, and they'll come and have a drink afterwards. And and I think, um, you know, I, I think it definitely, it's definitely something I think that it's a good way of kind of putting your toe in the water in that respect, mm. so we can get a ticket. I don't know what Dick would say. I mean, it's, it's a mix, it's a broad church. You do yeah. get the uber geeks at the centre of it, people that would try and come all the time and know everything mm. there is to know. But you do get all those sort of... I, I, when I say casual fans, that sounds like an insult. I don't mean that. I mean sort of new fans, but mm. fans that perhaps aren't as obsessive as other fans, but still get great joy out of seeing mm. it on the big screen yeah. and just hanging around with a lot of different people united by one single cause, you know? Yeah, it, it's... um. Like we were saying, Justin, if you, if you haven't gone to an event like this before, it's probably a really good, you know, sized and and um, you know atmosphere atmosphere fear of an event to go to rather than going to some mm. massive like London Film and Comic Con or something. Which you know haven't been to things like that. You know, it could be quite daunting in a way. Um, and and you know, like you were saying, Dick, there's a good mix of of fans here, and and it kind of feels like it's just like you know very inclusive and welcoming for everyone, really. 
So, um, which, which I think is great. And, and the other nice thing is, you know, the, in the audience with them will mm. be the you know people who worked in the box set or who you know made some of the animation. There might be people associated with the show who like coming along to some of these events. We've got, you know, there are, there are various people in the public eye who are big fans of the show and often come along, mm-hmm. um, like, you know, Frank Skinner and other people yeah. who kind of often be in the audience and just love the show so much they want to be at the BFI events. And, yeah, you know, you, it's, you it's, it's, it's a nice know people. Every, everybody's together and they're all on the same, you know, it's it's, it's one auditorium, it's fairly mm-hmm. intense and, you know, it's a, it's a fairly even even keel. The big, mm-hmm. the big thing is whether you get a seat K9 or not. That's, um, you know, we've got, we've got, you know, it's, it's, it's row, row K seat nine. And that is the, that's, that's the one that's, that's the gold yeah. ticket. <laughs> the, uh, there's also an element that, yeah. um, as Justin touched on there, the show has been running so long that a lot mm. of people working on the show now were fans of the show in the past. It's like a lot of modern day television that, yeah. but especially if it's, um, cult television, that mm. sort of, you know, whether it's a, a Star Trek series or something like that, the people running it are the people that used to watch it. Yeah. So it's got a, a, there's a different affection as well uh, for it. That's, so you do, we do get a lot of people who are associated with modern Who in one way or another, but have, have come into that through old Who. Mm. Mm. Um, I just want to ask a, a quick question, so I'll slightly divert for a second, but... Um... Have you both been, you know, Who fans for, since childhood, or do you, do you secretly not really like it at all? And <laughs> part of the job, Jeff. <laughs> that's a ninja question. That is. <laughs> I was. Uh, I watched it from day one. I was really? uh, yeah. another earthly childer and yeah. hooked straight away. Um, mm. But I guess when the Daleks came on, it was like mainlining. I was suddenly. <laughs> I, was, I thought, wow, this is this is the thing, you know. This is it. Yeah. yeah. I've yeah. often got on record that I mean, I, I was so fanatical. And I think it was only uh, Emma Peel in the Avengers that finally drew me back into <laughs> w- woke you up back from the dark side. You know? <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I was a big um, fan of the Tom Baker. Yeah. I can just about, I can very vaguely remember the end of Tom uh, of John Pertwee, or mm. I don't know if it's a repeat or whatever, but I, you know. I remember being very. I mean, I, Pyramids of Mars and Seeds of Doom are the two, two stories that I have the, the really strongest memories of and being yeah. really scared by. And uh, I loved the show. I had the the TARDIS, the Leela figure, the robot, and 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 the and the Doctor <laughs> figure. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and I remember like things like the little figures you get from the Weetabix packets. Yeah. yeah um, that stuff, and, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was it. You know, I mean. It, it, I wish that I'd had the access to the Doctor Who figures that they have now. Oh, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you about it. Now there yeah. are hundreds, aren't there? Yes. But, uh, yeah. I was, I, I mean, beyond that, I, I've always, I've, I've always loved the show. I've always bought like sort of yeah the videos or the DVDs. I hadn't been to any kind of conventions. I've definitely never done the start, <laughs> but um, I understand why people do. But it's just you know it's just not a world I have entered. Yeah. To, but 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 when luxury, we, um, <laughs> luxury. <laughs> <laughs> Looks yeah, that. ball bearing Daleks. <laughs> yes, Rollykins. I went. Uh, I, I went. Speak, to, they were. I think we 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 were we went to the XL in 2013, and I mm. looked one of the one of the rooms there. Like we did, like a DVT commentary room. Yes, I've so been to a couple the of, event, and I remember those were taking place. Yeah, yeah. And I've been to a couple. Like mm. you, you talked about the the, the the cutaway comics, Philip Hinchcliffe. I went up to Manchester last weekend and hosted a conversation with Philip um, for Cutaway, um, which has been filmed and comes out with a book. Yes, yes. Um, the, mm. the book is. I have to say, the book I've seen. Uh, kind it of looks amazing. Copy of it is fantastic. I have no. I have no reason to kind of to to, to sell it. I have no, no kind of uh, you know sort of um, mm. skin in the game on that one. But it is great. I think Gary Russell's done a great job. It's it's mm. like a. A number of really interesting curated pieces with then a, um i think gary or whoever it was did literally 20 or 30 hours of conversation mm. with philip and they've transcribed and written bits and pieces up in between and i think there is definitely stuff in there that people will never have heard before it's, it's a really fascinating book Brilliant. yeah i'm gonna I've got, I've got my name in for that one so i'm looking to receive it very very shortly yeah. i think they're going to yeah. do graham williams next and i think the plan is to kind of keep them going yeah, yeah, I think that's a great idea, and, and again, Graham Williams seems to be. It's uh, do you know, I every every time I see something on Graham Williams, it's like he put his absolute heart and soul into this. You know, he literally worked himself to the bone to to get this show out against unbelievable odds. You know, he had a really difficult time. Yeah, exactly. His yeah. era was 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 a very very difficult era, wasn't mm. it? Of 
No, I think the honeymoon period, as far as Tom was concerned, probably was 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 yeah, yeah. on the rocks there. Well, then, I've just got to point out that I'm about mm. to lose power. Plus, I've, I've got to be out of this room. Oh no! They very kindly <laughs> left. They didn't give you a plug it. socket, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, they haven't. Yeah. Um, so I just, on just wanted to warn well. you that I might, it might go dark from my end. <laughs> okay, but it's been fun. Thanks a lot. Well, uh, Justin, are you okay to stay on for? Just stay on for a little bit longer, yeah, of okay. course. All right. Well, um, I'll, I'll fire out a couple of questions quickly and, and see if you can. Um, uh, you got enough time to answer them uh, as well, Dick. So, which collection set uh, are you looking forward to screening in the future, or which which episode specifically? <laughs> you know, what's your one of your favourites? Don't say it? anything, Dick. Don't, uh, <laughs> don't don't give him anything. That wasn't <laughs> supposed to be a trap. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as part of your job there, is there anything else that you would like to screen? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to absolutely screen a complete box set of all the missing episodes. That's that's oh. the dream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, as soon Good as you answer. dig them out of your your basement, Dick, then we'll all be yeah. able to enjoy <laughs> that. You, you name the date, we'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Dick, what, when are you going to when are you going to give us those Marco Polo's back? Yes, yeah. come on. <laughs> <laughs> Enough time under the bridge now. <laughs> I imagine if they turned up, though, how yeah. exciting would that be? Yeah. Philip Morris lent them to lent them to Dick a few years ago, and you've not found <laughs> <laughs> you know so you're just hold on to these. that. <laughs> He's so, recording um, this, you know, that will slip out and then we'll be inundated. Yeah. It's out there on YouTube. Yeah, must be true. I've stored them yeah. under the 10th planet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let the rumor sites get hold of that one. We'll leak it out, you know, surreptitiously. Yeah, yeah. See it all blow up. I would like to have shown Pyramids of Mars. We, we, we didn't show mm. that the appropriate. Um, um, uh, oh, yeah. Set that we did at that mm. time. I can't remember. We, we did. Um, was it to come, or come with when we were done that season thing? 13, mm. wasn't it? Uh, we've done it in the past before my time, though. Yeah, before your time. Yeah, I'd like Is to that... see that old Seeds of Doom definitely would be to two. I've yeah. mentioned it before, just feel that kind of nostalgia back there. That'd be a good one, wouldn't it? It's, 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 got, it's actually got some quite big set pieces, Seeds of Doom, hasn't it? You know, particularly it's, in it's, the final it's, episode with the bizarre big, story. Yeah. It's kind of you know, that it's quite, it's quite brutal, actually. You know, that when that guy's kind of. Tied to a bed, being turned into a frog, yeah, into a plant. It's grim. Or some, or some kind of you know, like weird sort of butler mm. very he brings him like you know sort of yeah, room. yeah. It's very there's, odd. There's definitely something very surreal, macabre about that, which is creepy. You know, you sort of see why <laughs> Mary Whitehouse took exception to to all this kind of body horror. But yeah, it's um, mm. <laughs> but I love it. I love the season too because yeah, of course on the other side you've got an absolute raving psychotic nutter. In uh, you know, in in charge of everything, haven't you? Um, what's his name? Harrison Chase, isn't it? Yes. And uh, and he's played brilliantly, and he's much more than this than a lot of the shouty villains. You know what I mean? The shouty villains are just like, oh, oh, so Doctor, now it is time has come at last when you will meet your doom. Ha ha ha! I think this I think guy, in that kind of Hinchcliffe era, there was a real sense of of mm. right or wrong, good or bad. You know, I think it yeah, was it's a, very binary. In the Barry, yeah. Barry Letzer era, it was a bit more fuzzy. You know, like mm-hmm. you had the gentleman. You know, the master was very gentlemanly, and oh, doctor, he's watching his episode, the clangers yeah. off, stuff <laughs> the world. Whereas in, in the Philip Pinchcliffe era, you know, it's, it's much the baddies are bad, and there's no mm. two ways about it. Yeah, I, I I totally agree. But that, that but it's responsible for so many moments that have lived with generations, you know, a whole generation of fans who cannot forget that the mummies, you know, the the brain of Morbius slopping to the floor with Morbius screeching blind Sarah Jane, you know, the arc in space, uh, the bubble wrap hand, which was absolutely terrified me when I was a kid. I didn't know it was a bubble wrap. I thought that is some alien <laughs> lava a, bursting you, you out of this guy's it, face, you know. You know? <laughs> bubble so wrap. There's still nothing that can compare with that Dalek claw coming out from under the cloak in the, so, you know what, yeah. in the first we, season for, for me. That we was talking moment. about that. Yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right, Dick. You know, it's those moments that just, just bring us into it. And, you know, when we when we think about the current generation, you know, who have grown up, only known Doctor Who since 2005, we've got almost 20 years worth of of, of moments for those guys as well, you know, who've grown discover. up with, yeah. um, you know, burping wheelie bins. And for my daughter, <laughs> you know, the, the 
the one I make watch early Doctor Who. For her, it's the gas masks. You know, she kept yeah. Richard Wilson's face morphing into a into a World War Two gas mask, weeping angels. Oh, Doctor Are you Who. my daddy? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you my mummy. Go to your even, room. You know? <laughs> Go to That's your not the room. first time the dick said that to me. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to get into that. <laughs> so, so Dick, I've got to ask you before you before you lose power. Um, other other sort of TV things. If you're you're talking about archive TV programs, what are your favourites among the wider gamut of everything you've got access to? And what? can I just add to that? There's a question from who's Cl- Clive hyphen Lewis on Twitter who says, "What archive discovery are you most proud of?" And mm. um, all archive discoveries are important because it's like the television's past is like a jigsaw, and every piece. Mm builds up the picture. So I used to think that only the big missing programmes are good. But I think I'm most proud of how many of the last 1948 shows we got back. Because at one time we only had two. And in the wow. end we had, I think, 10 or 11 episodes. So we did a really good job on that. We mm. just publicity, basically. But um, at the time, as I say, I was a big fan of 60s television, all the ITC stuff, the Avengers, oh, all the filmed action yeah, stuff. Yeah. But it was only later you get into the single plays, the play mm. for today's and the armchair theatres, when you think, wow, there's, there's some extraordinary writing going on there. And um, I still think probably British television's finest moment is probably the singing detective with Edge of Darkness, a close second. You know, these are... These are masterpieces. Got to agree. Yeah, I. There is, singing there is, um, the stuff mm. coming back all the time, though, isn't it? In terms of things that are, you know, thought they've been lost forever. Little bits and pieces are coming back all the time, aren't mm-hmm. there? And there is still hope all the time. Is it just kind of filtering in, or does it arrive in, in a clump? Does someone literally just drive up with a skip in your door and just dump a whole load of stuff, or does it's it arrive like surreptitiously through the letterbox? Publicity. <laughs> Whenever we publicise yeah. something coming back, something else will almost invariably come back on the back of it. Mm. And recently, this this thing about film collectors in Leicester, when they're trying to prize open some of those collections to see if they're holding television, things like that may yeah. prove really fruitful. Yeah. Do you, Do you think there's any more who out there, or do you think everything that's lost has been found? Mm. No, I think there's definitely more out there. Really? In in I mean, there garden. are some there are some people out there who are probably a bit you know more in their twilight years, should we say, who have mm. got collections of thousands and thousands of, of pieces of film and, and tape. And and I guess um, they may not even know what they've got. And some mm. of the things they've got, they may not know that they're, that they're actually missing either as well. Yeah, yeah, possibly, yes. Yeah. So or it might be... If, Sorry, go on. Oh, if, maybe if, you know, they're not a, a fan and they don't, you know, like I said, they, they don't know it's missing, you know, that they might just have something there and yeah, not not be aware that people would be... And know. literally missing, missing TV could be anything from... Mm. You know, an episode of wrestling on, on ITV to Celebrity Squares to something very high end. You know, like as you say, like a, a play for today. Or you know, I mean, there, there are so many different things that are in that category, aren't yeah. there? Yeah. 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 As soon as scientists get off their ass and invent that time machine, it'll exactly. Yeah. The blue, yeah. blue box one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or, or maybe that's why they're missing in the first place because they somebody did go back in time to try and rescue them, uh, yeah. grab them all, you know, out of the out of the archives, and then jump forward in time. But actually, their machine broke or something. So. They they they're not actually going to land until the. Uh, well, maybe they took them back to a time we haven't come to yet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I think I've got a question yeah. for you. I just need thought of it now. So if you could, so if you if you were able to get access to one missing episode of Doctor Who that's not currently available now, but you had to swap it for an existing episode of Doctor <laughs> Who, oh. what would you go for? Oh. And what would you lose? <laughs> oh. That's a good it, question. That is going to be the fifth a terrible question. question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is cruel. <laughs> I couldn't lose anything. I wouldn't want to lose anything. I couldn't. So you can have. Yeah, you can, that's the problem, isn't it? You can have. You can have the the last episode of the Tenth Planet. But you've got to. You've got to give one up forever. I couldn't do it. <laughs> I've never thought of that question before, actually, but I quite it's like it. It's a good it. one. Yeah, that is that's, good, it's, yeah. it's made me that's feel cold one. inside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the horror of losing yet more Doctor Who, because if it's not here, we've always got the animations, and I hope they continue. It might mm. not be the, the best or the ideal representation for a lot of people, but, but it it's pretty close. Happen, it? yeah. And I've noticed they started to kind of make them – their own thing lately you know they're kind of playing around with the, the, the like sets that. and things i love it yeah I know, that, I know that, that sort of, 
that sort of Sophie's choice is like mm. it's, it's like something the master would do to the doctor. No, yeah. doctor, you can rescue one from the past. But yeah, one that's of it. <laughs> in, in terms of the animation, I know there are people. Oh, there we go. Oh, he's we, gone. We've oh, lost him. We've lost Dick, everybody. Oh dear. But thank you, Dick, if you're hearing us. That's brilliant. Pulled away. But just to say, but that that thing about the animation. I mean, there are definitely purists and i don't you know it's, it's not like there's a right or wrong on this but there mm. are people who remember the show really really vividly from the 60s they've got very fond memories mm, mm. they want it to be exactly as it was in their childhood in black and white and there are other people who recognize as well that you have to be a bit more commercial about these things and you have to make it a bit more relevant to mm. people well, like, today like the recent and, daleks in color yeah like daleks in color i mean it doesn't, doesn't take away from the original i mean i mm. guess the animation ones are slightly different because obviously they don't exist in the format that we're aware of at the moment yeah and if you if you do a redesign or if you make something um if you make a change because actually you know it, it's it's a sensible thing to do in terms of you know whether, whether it might be you know a white actor you know um taking a role that you know is, is playing yeah, a different yeah. race for mm. example then actually that makes a completely sensible thing to to, mm. to update that now. Yeah. Um, but I know there are some people who just are so focused on the fact they want mm. it to look like a certain way and be a certain thing, they just can't kind of get away from that. Yeah, it's it's the sort of head cannon type thing, isn't it? You know, want, wanting it you know a certain way, the way you imagine, and then when it doesn't do that, then you know it's it's not not right. It's not good. Well, you know? I think it's also like a like like a that kind of purist versus the kind of more creative or imaginative mm. side of things isn't it you know the purists wants it to be exactly how it was and there's nothing yeah. wrong with that because it because those things are important to them you know that that's the only representation of something they've got from a, a kind of a, a moment in their yeah. in their own personal history so if you see somebody doing something with it that perhaps doesn't kind of honor that if you like or how you feel respect it then i can see why people will get upset personally i i like that the animators take liberties with you know looking at something like uh, the macro terra for example you know those exteriors of of the base are, are, are fabulous and you know i i doubt the macro were anywhere near as animated in the actual show as they were in the in the animation so it's you know if anything which kind of brings Doctor Who to life, especially Doctor Who that we don't have access to anymore. And who knows, you know, they might redo the animations or somebody yeah, might maybe, yeah. do them in, in the future to, to a different style if I mean, fashions change. You, you have to give them a creative brief. You can't just say, mm. you know, yeah, it's do dull exactly to just repeat, you know, exactly as it was. You know, there's got to be some creative interest in it, you know, for the people making it, I think, like you say. Yeah, I agree. There are others who wouldn't. Yes, no, so, you know. but I can see their point of view. Yeah. You know, that's a that's the thing. I suppose I'm, I'm yeah, sitting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, it, Justin. I'm going to fire uh, two quick cool questions at you here. So the first is from our friend Fraser Gregory, and we ask this to every <laughs> guest on his behalf. Uh, and the question is: quarks or crotons when it comes to the series six event? <laughs> Whenever that might be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> whenever that would go. On. I'm... I that don't feel like I'm, a trap um, question as well, didn't it? Sorry. Well, yeah, yeah, no. I mean, I, you know, I really, really don't know. And, I, and actually, I think that the, the political answer, and I have no idea whenever that w will or whether mm. it will be available, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but I think that um, we would have a look and see which episodes had, you know, had the BBC had done what with, and we'd try and look and work out which would work best mm. for the interest in terms of, um, you know, the best uh, use of our screens and facilities yeah. and so forth. Do Do you have a preference to either of those uh, enemies? Quarks or crotons? Mm. Uh, let's go for quarks. <laughs> let's go for quarks. Go go quarks. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Yeah, we can uh, do quarks. And our, our friend uh, Didymus Holmes asks, have you ever been starstruck? Oh, that's event? a good question. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think that... Um, I'm very, I think you know, Dick and I are very lucky. You know, When, when mm. you walk to BFI... Literally almost every night we've got something going on along, along in our cinemas with, you know, amazing people from TV and film, from mm -hmm. also, you know, in front of the camera, behind the camera, somewhere in between. And um and and I guess you can't allow yourself to get too starstruck because you have you know, if you're hosting stuff on stage and or meeting in the green room stuff, you, what they don't want to see is somebody who's Mm. You know, grabbing lots of box sets, going to sign them, and wanting to sort of tell sign them, this, you know, "I love you so much." So you have to kind of contain it. Yeah, um, but you know, but I mean, it's impossible to say that. You know, the first time I met Tom Baker, I wasn't. You know, I wasn't yeah. after up, and I didn't feel. You no, know, that my kind of my eight year old self. Yeah, you know, how how I would have felt. Um, and 
I think I think Tom Baker's probably the one because his voice is so yeah, you know, his voice mm. has never changed either. And um and he's such an incredible person. Yeah. Um and um he arrived when we did the event with him in 2013. He arrived yeah. early, a lot earlier than we thought he was going to. Um, and I just sat in the green with him. I thought, well, I'm, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to talk to you about Doctor Who stuff at all initially. And I talked to him about the fact we had a Pasolini season going on at the moment, and he'd been in one of the Pasolini films, Canterbury Tales, oh, and right. about the fact that we had um, there were some other things that he'd been in. So I thought I'd kind of do it from that way in a very BFI way. Mm. Or I then kind of you know, went in because I thought that might make him a bit more, yeah, you know, sort of, um, more, yeah. more. And that seemed to be quite a good approach. Um, but he, but, but he was incredible on stage as well. You know, he did mm. an amazing event. Um, uh, early on in my career in the BFI with Mark Gatiss when there was like a kind of um, a, an event on stage with the two of them where Mark interviewed him. I think he literally needed about three or four questions and that was it because <laughs> just the same Tom just would yeah. just wander around the stage for about you know, sort of 20 minutes on his own answering about 14 <laughs> different questions he hadn't been asked. Um, <laughs> but um, but but beyond that, and just in terms of, sort of nostalgia once again, this is not a Doctor Who answer, but mm. although it has quite Doctor Who element to it because in the Sea Devils there is an episode of the Clangers um, yeah. When um, when we had Oliver Postgate and Peter Furman, and once again, oh. it, comes back, it comes back to the voice as well, you know, because yeah. Tom Baker's yeah. voice is being so distinctive. Oliver Postgate has got such a distinctive voice as well, yeah. and um, and he he um, he he brought Bagpus with him, literally in old in an old Sainsbury's carrier bag, mm. the original Bagpus, and, and I held the original Bagpus in my arms as Oliver Postgate was talking to me. And I think I almost started to cry. To be yeah. Honest. So emotional, and I I get that. <laughs> and, yeah, so um, so I think yeah, Tom Baker and Oliver Postgate are definitely two that have had have had wow. that kind of connection with yeah. Brilliant. I think yeah. I think my my wife would literally swap swap with you to have that experience with Bagpuss. Really, she's yeah. it's it's you know it's every generation grows up with these things at an early age and they mean so much. Yeah. and I get you you know to hear that voice and to be holding Bagpuss himself, you know, the, yeah, that was I, 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 I'm not even going to call it a prop. Because that's wanky. Bagpuss is Bagpuss, yeah. you know. It <laughs> was Bagpuss, you're right. Yeah, absolutely. It's just that's brilliant. All of those things. You're too young for that, for that, Jeff. You, no, you, I, you, I, you're... I, I may be, um, you know, younger <laughs> than you, Paul, but I do vaguely remember Bagpuss, you know, on. on yeah, um, I enjoyed that. Um, I bought the engine. I think that was another Oliver Postgate, that was, wasn't that was it? Oliver Postgate, it yeah. was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I, mean, I remember that <laughs> vaguely as well. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Justin, um, were you at the screening for Church on Ruby Road recently? Because obviously at the BFI you do occasionally do more recent Who stuff as well. That was um, that was a private hire actually that the um, that the, the the BBC themselves did. Mm. Um, and as it happened, I actually was I was I wasn't in London that night, so I actually ah. didn't that one. I'd been to some of the the previous Christmas ones, mm. um, previous sort of maybe four Christmas ones they did before they went to New Year. Um, but I, unfortunately, I missed that one. Yeah, that's a shame. Uh, that actually, fun. It, sometimes it's quite nice just to watch it on the day you're meant to on Christmas mm, Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah okay. With your family, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, without all the sort of gala trappings and everything else, it's just yeah. yeah, it could take something. But then, yeah, I mean, do, do you kind of get that? As could could you theoretically just kind of swan in and out of any of the BFI? Gala events that you do, you know, private hires as well as the public yeah. ones. Is, is there yeah, a seat with your name on it permanently? <laughs> um, yeah, I get. I mean, yeah, unless, I, yeah, I, I'm technically I could. Yeah, mm. that's quite a nice perk. Yeah, that's, good, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Well, don't I'm worry. Very, very lucky. I've, 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 I've met yeah. you in terms of the people who are still alive and working in the industry. Mm. I've met a lot of my favourites, and I'm incredibly lucky. Yeah, that's brilliant. It's fantastic, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, don't worry. We're not asked to you sneaking us in the back door of the fire exit yeah. or anything, anything <laughs> like that. But... That's lucky. Because <laughs> there isn't one. Yeah, there isn't a <laughs> fire exit. <laughs> there is a fire exit. <laughs> of course there is. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't say it was. But so, so just just very briefly then, Justin, I mean, how, how did you get involved in, in, in what you're doing in the first place? Where's where's your history come from? Um. Well, I... So I, when I first started working at the BFI, actually, I work, mm. was working a completely different non program related position although i had been doing sort of film reviews and um other sort of bits of sort of, mm. sort of film writing and and uh, i used to go onto bbc london radio and review the films every few, every few friday nights and other various bits and pieces and then i just kind of had an opportunity to start doing bits of programming here and there and i started hosting bits and pieces and it kind of just evolved from there and then various opportunities and job applications later mm. I ended up, you know, looking after the program for the South Bank. So I'm very lucky once again. You know, I've 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 got an incredibly 
you know, an incredibly brilliant job, really. Um, mm. yeah, it's an amazing place to work. And, uh, you know, I've got a dream job. I couldn't imagine doing anything. I would, it's not, nothing I can imagine doing. I, I'd rather do more. Yeah. Of it. yeah. Brilliant. I think that's well, that's, that's the, it? yeah, that's the dream, isn't it? To, yeah. You know, yeah. To love your job like that. Just brilliant. be doing that and to be at the heart of, of, of culture as well. You, mm. you know, it's British culture and cinema culture, it's TV as well. I think it's, yeah, it's extraordinary. It's, yeah, it's brilliant. You know, yeah. Working in the like, arts. Tomorrow, yeah, tomorrow, tomorrow night we've got um, mm. Alexander Payne and Paul Giamatti in the building. Really? Presenting then you film The Holdovers. Yeah. And on Wednesday night we've got Andrew um, We've got um, Andrew Haig presenting his new film, uh, All yeah. Uh You know, this weekend we've got the guys from Cartoon Saloon coming over from Ireland to talk about their animated films, you know, Wolf Walkers, um, Song of the Sea, mm. Secret of Kells, and so you know, th th every day there's something incredible happening, you know. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're very lucky. Yeah. Well, uh, Justin and, and Dick, who's now gone, it's been a real pleasure talking to you guys tonight, and hopefully um, our listeners and you know, mm. some BFI fans, you know, event fans among them have enjoyed it as well. And, um, you know, Good luck for the forthcoming event. I hope it all goes well, and hope we get to get to meet you at one soon as well. Yes, so indeed. We yeah, that's okay. been a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of fun. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for joining us tonight, Justin. <laughs> and uh, thanks for listening, everyone. And we'll uh, catch you on Who Corner to Corner very soon. Bye bye for now. Bye.